if uh, like so. We start pretty soft with uh, who who is SWEP, what is SWEP. SWEP is a um, American Americanly owned Swedish based brace plate heat exchanger company. Uh, we do brace plate heat exchangers. That is our specialty. Uh, we consider ourselves, uh, uh, the, you know, the the the, the, the a world class leader in this technology. Uh, we are part of Dover Corporation, based here in the, in, uh, in the Chicago area, which is a very big company. Uh, SWEP is a medium-sized company, I would say, 1,000 employees, but we are very global. We are from everywhere, from uh, from Osaka to to California and everything in between. Um, uh, uh, we make about three and a half million heat exchangers per year uh, out of our five factories, two in in um, uh, Europe. Uh, one in China, one in Kuala Lumpur, and one in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, and with this, uh, with the, since we are focusing on, on US today with the Tulsa uh, uh, production site, we are covering uh, most of the needs of our uh, US uh, and, and, and Canadian or North American uh, customers. Um, and, um, and wants to be very close to to the market here. Uh, then certifications, we work with ISO and IHRI and uh, certifications as such, but that is not the focus on this presentation, so I will move on. Freezing. Why is freezing a problem in heat exchangers? And I'll start with a little bit of, of basic physics. Ice has 9% lower density in the water, meaning that it the same mass of, of, of water becomes ice, it takes up about 9% more space. So each time, each time water freezes completely, it takes up 9% more space. And if you then thaw the ice and make it water and then freeze it again, it takes 9% more again. So it becomes an incremental the, the 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 size required when you when you freeze and freeze and freeze again uh, is that the the um, it takes up more space and what we can see here is a cross section of a frozen heat exchangers down here you see this little bit uh, rhombic size that is a how a uh, how a brace bed heat exchanger should look when you cut it open and and um, look inside what you can see here the round that is a uh, a channel where there has been been forming ice several times. So this these straight lines have been ballooned up by the ice uh, with the increasing volume of the ice. And this becomes then a, a critical problem when the 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 freezing cycles has become so many and this the steel has become so stretched out that there is a, a rupture and a break of, of the plate and you have mixture between the, the side one and side two. And then you have a leak. Um, that's why freezing is a problem. When, when does freezing happen? And we'll start over to the left. A obvious, and but not, you know, don't forget about it. Uh, if a uh, if a heat exchanger or any object with filled with water is put outside in a cold weather, it will freeze. Um, and if this is a you know some kind of a system with a heat exchanger in it, typically uh, the the brace plate heat exchangers will or the heat exchanger will freeze last because there is a lot of water in it. If if water is allowed to be inside the system which is shouldn't, but if there is water in the system, the, the heat exchanger will freeze last um, because there's a lot of, you know, uh, thermal uh, inertia uh, in the heat exchanger. So all the piping will have frozen first. So if this happens, there will, there's really nowhere the water can go when the ice starts to form. So, you know, it will just become, you know, the last, uh, the last part of the chain that will get all the, the, uh, the freezing, uh, uh, the, the feel the increased pressure of the uh, of the ice inside the system. Um, so this is this is not an you know it's pretty uncommon, but it's not unheard of that this kind of freezing damage. What we'll focus on today instead is the cold operation conditions, meaning that there is a a cold fluid that is so cold 
uh, that it cools down the warm fluid and actually creates ice inside. Um, and, uh, if, and of course, if the operating conditions inside here becomes uh, below the freezing conditions of the, of the, of the warm fluid, it, it may freeze. Uh, and the most common of these conditions is, of course, evaporators which is a common uh, application for brace plate heat exchangers and where we see the most common uh, freezing problems. So that's what we're focusing on today. So what does SWEP do to avoid freezing and freezing damage? Well, one thing very simplistic is we try, we see how much freezing damage can a brace plate heat exchanger take. I call it the Rocky factor. How many times can you get knocked down and get back up? Uh, but that's inofficial. We'll look at that. What else do we do? Well, we look at freezing behavior. Um, what kind of critical parameters are important to keep in track of uh, to make sure that you are not wandering close or trespass into the freezing uh, zone? We will look at that. Uh, how does how does SWEP work with the, uh, the brace plate heat exchanger geometry to make sure that the freezing doesn't occur as easy, or if it's occur, it doesn't hurt the plate uh, as easily? That's something we're working with. And then, of course, we try to understand when does freezing happen and how to avoid it. And that is something we are you know, very much in discussion with. Um, also with our customers and, and finding out how can we, uh, when does the freezing risk core occur and how do we avoid it in the, in the most efficient and, and also cost efficient way. We'll try to cover this. So let's start with the first one, freeze damage testing. Well, there are several ways to do this. And, and one very simplistic way is to do it, you know, almost like putting a, a heat exchanger out in the cold, like we, like I discussed on the two slides back. So the scope of this evaluation is just to see how many, how many complete freezing cycles uh, with to total freezing on the, on the water side can a heat exchanger take before it starts to break. Um, and, you know, just a, a, a please a note here. This is nothing we recommend. A system that is designed and allowed to freeze will do so and it will continue to freeze until breakage. So this is not a this is not a good way to avoid freezing damage. This is just a way to see how you know how many freezing cycles can we take before it goes bad. So avoiding freezing is the only way to make sure that there is no uh, leakage due to freezing. However. Even if the system is designed in a perfect way, something bad can happen. So there could be a pump failure, could be a closed valve, could be a refrigerant leak, something that are, is not part of the normal operation that cr cr makes the, the heat exchanger completely freeze. That's why a heat exchanger will have to be able to take some kind of punishment before it breaks, the rocky factor, right? So what the kind of test we do is like a, a worst case scenario with complete freezing, nowhere out, all 100% of the, of the water becomes ice and we, then we tow it and refreeze it, tow it, refreeze it. So there is this you know, worst case scenario of making sure that there is maximum freeze damage. Um, the, the, the amount of freeze damage that the heat exchanger can take depends on the, on, on the different models we have. Uh, this is one example of a, you know, there are, we have worse and better heat exchangers than this, but this is, you know, since we're working on it, this is, we're trying to move, uh, we're, we're working on to moving it to the right here, right, to, to have more and more complete freezing cycles. But the kind of answer we get is like a, a bell curve, where we see that uh, in this case here, we had a, uh, two damaged heat exchangers after after 10 complete freezing cycles. There was a lot of turnout at, at the 15 freezing cycles, and then 20, 25, we had uh, all of them coming out. Again, this is not a, this is just an indication of, of one heat exchanger uh, model of SWEP, uh, but it, it shows, you know, it's, it doesn't say, it. at least it answers the question, a, a heat exchanger, a brace plate heat exchanger will not break immediately after a freezing. It will take, you know, 10 to 15 before you start to have any any kind of um, uh, turnout on this. 
The next one, freezing behavior. And I said starting point because we have to start over here. Um, freezing, and this is important, freezing will only start if the wall temperature on the water side goes below freezing temperature. This is good and bad. It means that the wall temperature may be safe even if the evaporation temperature is below the freezing temperature. So in this case here, we have a, uh, an, an evaporation temperature of the refrigerant at 25 Fahrenheit minus 3.9 Celsius, which is you know absolutely cold, right? Uh, but due to the boundary layer of the, uh, on the refrigerant side, the heat transfer to the plate, the boundary, la boundary layer on, on, the, on the water side, you can still have a wall temperature that is, in this case, you, you know, just on the edge, but you, it, you, can, you can operate a heat exchanger with lower than freezing temperature on the refrigerant side and still avoid freezing. Um, the, uh, the, 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 that's the, that's the plus side. The, the negative side on the same one is that even though you have water at 40 Fahrenheit or 4.4 Celsius, which shouldn't freeze, you can run into freezing even though you have, so to say, a bulk temperature that shouldn't be freezing. You can measure this on, on the outside and you, you have an outlet temperature about 40 Fahrenheit and you, you still have freezing in your heat exchanger and you're wondering why, you know, it shouldn't be freezing. But what's happening then is that you have a cold spot inside your heat exchanger where this wall temperature has gone below the, the, the 32 series uh, threshold and you start to have freezing in, you know, one or two channels. And that, if that's allowed to propagate, that is enough then to start uh, and creating a freeze damage inside the heat exchanger. Um, so those those are those are things to keep in mind, and we'll we'll we will we'll, we will return to this. Um, another thing also to keep in mind is that freezing is typically not a problem during a steady state operation. It's not something that happens when the chiller is is running or a heat pump is running. Uh, it's it's after 30 minutes. It always happens during transient startup reversing something is uh, uh, it, it, that is when it the uh, the critical situation arises and that's where you have to concentrate when you do the uh, um, the anti-freezing uh, actions so by doing these tests uh, and and uh, evaluating the the temperature the flow and the evaporation temperature we we found out we we were uh, evaluating the 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 main parameters uh, uh, the, the temperature uh, on the water side, evaporation side, and the water flows, and then also our different G BPHG geometries. And what we did find out then, the tests we did to to provoke freezing in our laboratory, and we have we have done this kind of freezing behavior test on all our heat exchangers that are inclined for chillers and heat pumps. Um, so we have this kind of uh, uh, polynomial um, freezing data on our, all our uh, relevant heat exchangers. So how to use this? So uh, we have a, a 3D graph. Uh, so one is the, uh, the water temperature, the living water temperature. One is the, uh, the water flow ratio. Uh, so it's higher flow over here and lower flow over here. And then we have the evaporation temperature. So with this uh, material, with this uh, you know, mathematical model based on our test, we would be able to, in this case here, so in, in this first point here, we have you know, nominal, nominal flow ratio, pretty, like say typically a 10 Fahrenheit, about five Celsius delta T in a water side, nominal flow. And with a, a living water temperature, 60 Fahrenheit, which is pretty high, we then can see that freezing starts to happen about 13, 14 Fahrenheit. So it's a very low evaporation temperature. And we can operate without getting freezing due to this, um, uh, that the, the, it's only when we come down to 14 Fahrenheit that the wall temperature start to be in the dangerous area. 
for this due to the, the relatively warm bulk temperature of the water. Okay, but then what happens if we lower the water flow? So if we lower the wa water flow and maintaining the, the capacity of the, uh, of the, the compressor is running as it, as it did before, what happens then? The um, living water temperature is set to be the same. It will go up here. And then we see that now we have reached a the critical uh, wall temperature already at at uh, at 20 Fahrenheit. So this kind of the freezing behavior test we have is helping us to um, help our customers to understand where are the where are the boundary layers, where are the boundary conditions, sorry, where are the boundary conditions for freezing, and then go up a little bit right you we know where is the where is the critical point and then in a discussion with our customer we can see how much safety margin do we want to have here do you really have to operate at 24 night or can we go up to 26 or something like this that that is when when we go from laboratory data into um, uh, common sense which is always a uh, important uh, step to take so with this, with this kind of test, right, and this kind of, of, of freezing behavior uh, evaluations we have done, we were able to see, among other things, that not all brace plates are the same. Um, so if we take the, the, the green one here and the blue one, uh, we, we prefer the green one. Um, it's, it's a stable, with a heat exchanger with a stable freezing profile and not as volatile as the the bluish one, it's much easier to keep track of, right? And uh, there is a, a less of a um, you know less of a, a variation depending on the conditions of the um, um, of, of the of the operating conditions of the day or the transition. So the we have been working with the, the the freezing tests and and designed away from cold spots and volatile flow geometries to make sure that we our our heat exchangers for chillos and heat pump has a the best uh, freezing behavior that we could uh, that we could give them and this kind of freezing behavior test that is part of our our normal development uh, process since several several years so we start with CFD analysis and analyzing anal anal analyzing the flow of the pattern. Then we create a heat exchanger. We we uh, we test it. We do a performance test, mechanical test, and we do the freeze test to verify that the um, uh, both both to know that the, the the freezing behavior is where it is and how it is, uh, and to verify that it's working as it should. And then we have a proof product and we put it on the market. And, and we are then uh, also footed to help our customers to address this uh, issue uh, if they're interested, if, they, if it's a problem for them, of course. That, you know, I don't think you expected me to be able to, to go through freeze damage testing, freeze behavior and BPG design consideration in about 20 minutes. But that is as much as I, I'm, I'm able to go through it right now and I don't want to go too deep in it because of course there could be I could speak days about this um, but let's go instead and see how could avoid freezing how do we do that and it's as always know your enemy so there are two high risk situations that we will focus on so high risk situation one startup or reversing at the low ambient temperature and the key word here is low ambient temperature why is that so important? Well, the, at the low ambient temperature, the condensing temperature will be pushed down, right? Because the condensing temperature is, is related to the ambient temperature and that will be pushed down. Then what happens with that point is that the compressor capacity will increase. So what we see down here is that this is a cooling capacity and this is compression ratio. So with the, with the, if, if it's very cold outside, the pressure of the condenser will go down. So with a cold ambient temperature, we will move to the left on this graph here. And if we look on the compressor, if we go to the left, it will go up. It will, the, uh, the capacity of the compressor will increase 
when the condensing pressure goes down. So that's step number one. Step number two is the expansion valve. That works in the opposite way. So the expansion valve capacity decreases when the compression ratio decreases. So again, the, the condensing pressure uh, goes down, and now we go on the expansion valve curve, and it will, will go down like this. So even if you have a perfectly balanced expansion valve and compressor during the normal stable conditions, it could happen that during a cold ambient startup, you have a compressor that is a little bit uh, overdimensioned and the expansion valve that is a little underdimensioned. And what will happen then, what could happen then, what could happen then is that the, the uh, expansion valve responds to this discrepancy by, I have to work more. And then it wants more superheat to open the valve even more. And if the nominal superheat is up here and we are able to have a pretty good evaporation temperature, when the expansion valve asks for more and more superheat to be able to open, it can result in that the uh, evaporation temperature is further pushed downwards. So it's a, it's a chain of events that leads to this. Um, and this is just, you know, this is just, just to know and to keep an eye on, and we will see how to avoid it, how to counteract this later on. High risk situation number two, N low or no water flow. And that is a, you know, that shouldn't be a problem, right? If, uh, if a system is working, there should be water flow. So why does not water arrive to the evaporator? I don't know. It could be a faulty pump. It could be an energy saving pump that decided right now was a good idea to save energy. It could be a, that a wrong valve is closed. It could be a human error. And the answer to this, you know, I don't know why there is no flow to the to the evaporator, and nobody knows because in a power point, uh, the, um, the the water flow is very easy to to identify, but in the real world, it's not so. Right in a in a real HVAC installation, you know, there are so many things that can go wrong um, that sometimes water doesn't go to the right place. And that is a that's a risk for freezing, um, because if if there is no water flow coming to the evaporator, uh, it will um, it will pretty fast go down in evaporation temperature, and uh, and and the wall temperature will go down to to 32 or below, and it will start to freeze. And if there is no um, if there is no safeguard uh, during the startup, which you know which is normally they are not on the on the compressor side because there is this uh, startup uh, period when the compressor uh, doesn't really listen to um, low pressure warnings because it has to rev up. There is a risk that the during this uh, transition period, if there is no water, that uh, that the heat exchangers start to freeze, and then you have uh, a few channels frozen on your hands when when the compressor is up and running, and you have to you know. Uh, know about it and, and handle it. So those are the two main main risk factors that we'll try to uh, avoid here. Um, so how do we? <laughs> that comes a more a more difficult question. How do we how do we solve that then? Well, there are you know two two main uh, criteria in the water side and refrigerant side, and then there are some system design points. We start on the water side. So we already established that so to keep water flowing and avoid obstructions, that is that is very important, right? So verify that water flow is on before you start the compressor. And having a flow switch or a flow meter is the single most best solution to this. There is there is other ways. There are you know temperature uh, delta T sensors. There are other ways, but the only way that you really know that there is a uh, flow or not is with the flow switch or flow meter. Um, when it comes to the the um, as you saw with the uh, with the 3D graphs before, uh, the water temperature was kind of important. And what is the um, 
uh, it's important to know where to measure the, the water temperature. And I would say in this port here, um, in an evaporator, in a brace plate, the um, uh, refrigerant typically goes in on, 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 on the bottom and up on the top. Um, and regardless how the water flows, if it goes in here or out or in here, regardless if it's a um, uh, where the where how the water flows, you want to know the temperature adjacent to to the where the refrigerant comes in because it is the uh, the relation between the the evaporation temperature in this area and the water temperature in this area that will give you the data you need to find out find your points in the 3D graph that we saw before. Um, another one we will not touch upon very much, but is uh, make sure that you don't have any kind of blockage in your heat exchanger. We have a complete fouling webinar focusing on this, but to have a, a strainer on the water side to make sure you don't have micro fouling is a very good idea as well. Um, on the refrigerant side, and here we have a little bit of a map where we also see where the things I brought up before. So on the refrigerant side, uh, what we would like to know to be able to use the uh, the, the 3D graph is uh, evaporation uh, temperature and the, and the superheat. And the best way to measure the the evaporation temperature is to have a pressure sensor at the at the outlet of the evaporator. Uh, because with the with the pressure sensor you get the saturation pressure and then you automatically know the saturation temperature. Um, uh, to be able to establish the the superheat, it's very good to have a, a temperature sensor there as well, so you can have then the difference between the saturation uh, saturation temperature from this sensor and the actual temperature from this one. Then you also have the superheat, and then you have the two main parameters that you need. Uh, if you if you only take the temperature and not the pressure, then you have information that you is harder to use because then you have the the outlet temperature, but it's including both evaporation temperature and the superheat. So it's hard to use. It's hard really to know what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, evaporation temperature you have inside here. There is another way of measuring evaporation temperature that I know of. Uh, I marked it in gray because I don't really like it, but I know it's there. Um, there is a way to measure, uh, if you measure uh, the, the temperature on the inlet of the evaporator, you have, you know, you have the, you're so to say measuring the saturation uh, temperature there. The problem is that if your heat exchanger has a distribution system, that will lower the actual evaporation temperature inside the evaporator uh, to several several degrees lower what you're measuring here. So it you can you can adjust for that uh, by you know by knowing how much pressure drop there is in the distribution system. But it's it's since it's an indirect version of of, of measuring, it's something that it's not it's not the best. Um, I will just linger here. There is so much information that I'm giving you now, so I'm 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 lingering a little bit more. So in this in this uh, diagram here, we see the flow switch, uh, which on on the water side we have the strainer uh, to stop any big particle particles to come in and block the water flow, uh, because if you if you uh, if you block one channel. Um, so there is not so much flow in one channel on the on the on the brace plate. Uh, there, it will still be filled of water, but there will be uh, uh, less of a boundary layer from on the water side. So it will be easier that the wall temperature goes down uh, below to the uh, to the freezing temperature. And then the, here is also the temperature sensor uh, positioned in the right in the right way on the uh, uh, on on the. Um, the water port adjacent to the refrigerant inlet port. Good. Um, so designing the system, uh, how to avoid fr uh, freezing. One thing that you can ask from your uh, heat exchanger uh, supplier is about distribution systems. Uh, evaporators are uh, in the in the in the inlet of evaporators. You have 
liquid and refrigerant gas coming in. And in the uh, image to the left, we have a, a system with a poor distribution of, of this liquid and gas refrigerant. So uh, in this dark blue uh, channels, there is a lot of liquid refrigerant. Uh, and uh, so it becomes a, an evaporator all the way through. Uh, on the other channels, there is much less liquid refrigerant and much more just gases refrigerant. So it becomes a, a big part of this uh, heat exchanger surface. It's not working as an evaporator, it's just a gas cooler. Uh, in, the, in the right heat exchanger, we have a, uh, a better distribution, not perfect, but much better, uh, where a much larger part of the heat exchanger is working as an, uh, as an evaporator. And the, the, the risk with a uh, evaporator with poor distribution like this is that you have, you create cold spots. It doesn't automatically mean you will have freezing, but when you start to, when you start to go closer to the, the freezing point, you, it will start to happen in this channel here. This is where you will start to have um, freezing. You can start to have freezing in this area in an earlier stage than in, in the other channels here. In, in this condition, you will have a much more stable and, and uniform performance of, of, the, of the heat exchanger and you don't have to care so much about a, this um, uh, uh, cold spot that is, um, uh, it will, will be uh, driving the risk for freezing. Uh, we have a separate uh, webinar also on distribution system, how to select them and, and uh, what they are on, on this link here. It's also part of the, uh, of the handouts. Another one is correct superheating. And we have come back to superheating several times. And now we will look on, on in it from a different point of view. A, a high superheat, we already discussed before, will push down the evaporation temperature. Uh, and it is especially important in co-current flow evaporators. Why would you ever want to have a co-current flow evaporator or parallel flow is also another way of saying it. Um, that is, for a reversible system and uh, heat pumps and, and uh, 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 rooftop units, etc. Uh, so in this case here, we have inlet water temperature at uh, 50 degrees, outlet water temperature at 40 degrees, and, and the evaporating conditions, the inlet is over here, it evaporates at, at a constant temperature as it does, and then somewhere in the heat exchanger, all the refrigerant is uh, in this line here, all the refrigerant is, uh, is evaporated and you start to have superheating. And in this case, we have 10 degrees superheating. And to have some kind of heat transfer uh, uh, driving force, I have uh, inserted a two degree uh, temperature difference here. And what is clear when we have a, a, a co-current uh, temperature program is that since the leaving water temperature and the leaving gas temperature, they are at the same, they are meeting each other. If we are increasing this superheat from 10 Fahrenheit to, let's say, you know, 12 Fahrenheit, what will happen? Well, if I if I go from 28 plus 12, that's 40, right? But I to be able to have some kind of heat transfer, there will be a temperature difference might not be too Fahrenheit, but let's say for uh, for this example, it will be. So we go from 28 up to 40, and that's not possible because then we are crossing temperatures. What will happen then is that the evaporation temperature will go down from 28 to 26, and then we will have an outlet temperature of 38 again. So with a co-current evaporator, the, the, uh, the superheat is very, very important. And the lower superheat you can operate with in a stable way, the, the, you know, it will have a much higher, much, enormous impact on the evaporation temperature. Um, so that leads us to point number two, make sure that the expansion valve is, is correctly sized and set also for a reversing uh, system like this. And um, that is not underdimensioned or, or you know, react in a strange way when when um, uh, when operating in, in a 
uh, in a co-current evaporator, especially doing startup. Um, and there are, of course, different uh, different ways of, of addressing this with a thermal expansion valve and an ele electronic expansion valve, but that's beyond today's uh, curriculum. So, and then the last one is maintain turbulent water flows always. We have it has always already been established today that water flow is key, right? It's very important. It's directly one of the key parameters for for uh, 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 establishing the the wall temperature, right? Uh, another thing is that um, if a good thing with brace plates is that they have a uh, they can they start to uh, revert to a turbulent flow already at Reynolds 150. So it's a very uh, a very quick movement from laminar to turbulent flow, and then they they develop a better better turbulent flow up to 500, and then it's completely 100% uh, turbulent about there. Um, but the problem if you have a laminar or poor poorly developed uh, turbulent flow is that you can have 50 degrees here in the center and you can measure temp temperature of 50 degrees and you think okay i'm far from freezing but if you have a very laminar flow inside the 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 the, the, the water temperature close to the uh, wall can be 32 degrees because there is very little interaction uh, between the bulk and the the boundary layer when it's laminar flow when at the turbulent flow you still have a, a small boundary layer which is you know uh, exaggerated in this image but the, the importance with turbulent flow is that the the bulk of the water and the boundary layer they are constantly shifting so there is less risk that there will be a cold spot next to the wall and um, so uh, keeping water flowing and keeping it turbulent is again one of the critical things and if you want to know more about turbulence in brace plate heat exchangers there is a link to that too that you will be able to reach when you once you download this um, presentation in pdf format now we will go a little bit more into the um the uh, what i've been trying to to answer so far are the uh, the most direct on spot efficient and cost efficient answers to uh, the, the dangers the 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 um, startup at uh, low ambient and no flow and how to address those um, there are other ways of doing it uh, and they can be you know effect effective but could also be more more expensive but if we look on the on the condenser side pressure control so the uh, we do know that you know if if the condensing pressure goes down we have this problem as we discussed before right so if you have if you have a system where you have a risk of a low ambient uh, condenser what can you do about it right uh, if you have a two step compressor or inverter or digital scroll is it possible to during the startup or or when the heat when the system is reversing to limit the compressor capacity run at lower capacity or something like this that will really help because it will reduce this um, uh, it will reduce this uh, damage point and move it closer to the to the nominal position um, another one is that can be pretty easy is just to you have a if you have an air coil condenser don't start the fan right make the condenser as less efficient as possible to during the uh, during the startup until the condenser pressure has 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 stabilized at the, at a normal level. Uh, those are the simplistic ones. A little bit more advanced is to have a, a special uh, condensing pressure control valve. It's like a small modulating valve, uh, similar to expansion valve, but just after the condenser. So what will this valve will do is to to measure the uh, uh, the pressure ratio between the uh, or actually the, the condensing pressure itself and if that starts to be too low it it it, it uh, closes down and fills up the condenser with uh, with a liquid and, and making the condenser less efficient uh, and it's that way also uh, you know doing the same thing moving moving up the compression ratio line that's on the condenser side another one hot gas bypass freeze protection that is 
you know, now we start to be a little bit fancy here. So after the compressor, you can have a uh, the discharge line from the compressor. You, it's hot gas, of course, and then you can have a a, a valve that opens up when there is risk of freezing and uh, um, puts pushes in hot high pressure gas in the cold mixture from uh, from the expansion valve, and then you know very efficiently. Uh, you know, increasing the uh, the temperature and making the um, uh, less risk of of freezing during that. The, it, you know, when when this opens up, it's also you know reducing the efficiency of the system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a pure uh, antifreeze um, solution that is um, uh, required. You know, speci specific uh, uh, components and control of the system. And that is actually it. It's uh, as I said, I can continue to to talk about this, but I I wanted to, to keep it in about uh, you know 45 minutes, and and instead open up for questions. So, if there are any questions, I would like to address them now. Thank you, Adam. Um, um, there are some questions that has. Um... Let's see. Well, I want to pass some feedback along to you. Um, we had someone say the presentation is awesome, that they've learned a lot from from this. So um, that's we want to educate and we want people to learn. So I just wanted to pass that on to you, Adam. Good job. Thank you. Um, also another, uh, so the, a question we got towards the first part of your presentation is, um, if, if the water side expands 9% each freeze cycle, would you notice a higher pressure drop on the refrigerant side? Um, it's it's very hard to yes you would um, uh, but it's very hard to measure pressure drop on the refrigerant side it's um, 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 th there is in a normal system there is no pressure drop uh, uh, sensor on on the on the refrigerant side so you would you would over time uh, when the water ch channels become more and more uh, you know ballooned up. The other channels on the other side will be more and more squished. So yes, but it's not a good way to uh, to detect freezing. It's um, it's very hard to do. Okay, thank you. Um, next question uh, that came in a, a couple minutes after that, so it's also towards the front. Um, does the freeze cycle depend on the number of plates in the heat exchanger based on what you have seen? Uh, not directly on the number of plates, no. Um, but the the uh, I, I took away some information here to make it. You know, this is already a lot to start to speak about a 3D 3D graph on a, on a webinar. But what we're looking at here is is flow. You know, flow per channel and and the, the flow ratio. So if you have you know 10 GPM in a uh, in heat exchanger with 10 plates or 10 GPM in a, a heat exchanger with 100 plates. That means that in a 10 GPM with 10 plates, you will have, you will be over here, a, a lot of water flow and very little risk for freezing. And the same flow on 100 plates, you will be all the way over here because it's much lower flow per channel. So in that way, the the number of plates and the flow the critical flow are are going hand in hand. The that's one part of the answer. The the uh, the second part of the answer is comes down to uh, distribution systems. And in an evaporator with few plates, relatively few plates, the risk of maldistribution, as we see here, is 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 lower because there are less refrigerant channels. But if we have a, a 300 uh, plate evaporator with poor distribution system or no distribution system, um, then there will be a, 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 a very big part of the heat exchanger that is not working efficiently as an evaporator, but more of a of a, some kind of a gas cooler, and um, that will create a large cold spot. So. As as long as there is as long as the water flow and the number of plates goes hand in hand to reach the critical flow, there is then you're fine. 
but with the increasing number of plates, you have to be make sure that there is a, a functioning distribution system that you know keeps you on the right side. I think that's it. Okay, let me get to sorry the next. Let's see. Okay. Is the 3D freeze curve available for a given heat exchanger or a generic one? In parentheses, flow, bulk type, evaporation temperature. Question this, one. this, um, the, 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 um, it's, it's, it's a 3D graph only when we want to visualize it, like we want to do in this webinar. But the, the real value of this is the polynomial, right? So it's a mathematic. Uh, discussion that's that's when it starts to make sense um, without I mean I think it's clear to to anyone listening that that is a, a pretty uh, confidential piece of information for for SWEP to to know that much detail about our heat exchanger so yes this this information is available and it's available to uh, to, to partnering customers where we work with and we want to and we have the possibility to to help them uh, so we, so in short we don't send it out uh, to anyone who asks but if there is a uh, uh, if there is a, a, a customer we are working with and they are uh, um, worried about this problem and they they have a possibility to act on this kind of data we would be more than happy to collaborate with them And 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 then on the on this so say, second part of that answer is that even though even though the the um, the three D graph so to say is the the three D graph has already given us so much information on how to avoid freezing so just by um, in in the way of 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 um, by knowing that you sh you know by by knowing that you should have a strainer, you should have a, uh, you know control the water flow, uh, and have a, a temperature sensor, avoiding it's it's easy to simplify this information quite a lot, right? Uh, you this is only this is only very important if you are if you have a system that goes very close down to the to the um, to the danger zone. But if you if you say, well, I'm going to limit my evaporation temperature always to be above 28, for example, then you're up here, and you don't, in some way, you you can simplify. You don't need to know where the polynomial is is actually being because you have chosen a a safe spot that is hovering up here, and that is a that is a, um, a, a you know. A, a simplistic and cost efficient and and uh, kind of a pragmatic approach to to freezing that you don't have to work down here in the uh, you know in, in the in the spot point where you start to freeze you can select to i want to i don't want to have any risk to be a problem i'll i'll leave it myself at 20 28 to 24 and those kind of information we can we can um, we can give to a customer based on um, on, on the model that we're working with, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next one, um, is there a reason you have the flow switch on the water inlet flow rather than the outlet? Yes, there is. Uh, it's a recommendation from, um, we have been working with a, um, a flow switch uh, suppliers called Sika, S-I-K-I. Uh, they are, um, we uh, we have a we work with them with with a with a flow switch program to to uh, to you know to, for for the North American heat pump market, and it was on their recommendation that the strainer it's it was easier the the flow going inside the heat exchanger is more so it's a uniform than the flow coming out. So if you have a flow switch on the outside and you have it too close to the outlet that can create um, disturbances based on on what happens to the to the flow inside the heat exchanger but if so they recommended us to to illustrate the strainer sorry the flow switch the flow switch on the inlet of of the water flow however 
if the flow switch is placed on the exit and it's just you know maybe uh, three feet or a meter away or something like this and i would like to refer that question to sika but um, if if you had the flow switch a little bit away then it's also good but it's uh, as a as a general rule it's better to have the flow switch sp flow switch on the uh, when there there is a stable flow uh, created in the before the inlet of the brace plate heat exchanger. Okay. Um, then another question is: uh, Will we be doing a webinar uh, in regards to operation with blend refrigerants, um, blend refrigerant temperature glide on a BPHE? That is, uh, we already have uh, um, webinars out there on SWEP's take on the new refrigerants coming up. And there is also webinars available on our, on our YouTube channel, SWEP MC, uh, for how to calculate with um, uh, aseotropic or glide refrigerants. Um, so I, I recommend you to start there, but as as the new refrigerants come along with a four or five four B and the other ones with Glide, we will we will look more into that. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going through. I think that maybe um, we had a, a couple of people tell you um, excellent presentation. Excellent presentation thank you very much um uh, here's one question does mm. refrigerant mass flow rate play a role on the freezing in that 3d graph you showed uh that is uh, this is of course the capacity that is a, it's a very ex excellent question and um uh and i would like to uh uh it it does and i would like to uh, uh that was one of those questions that i you know i uh, the, the part of the presentation that I took away to be able to to keep this this webinar uh, in less than a day, <laughs> but yes. Okay, um, and then let's see. Does SWEP make these three D uh, polynomial graphs with a true dual plate using one water and a vap and a condenser? Are you aware of any issues not covered here with freezing on a true dual heat exchanger? Um, the a true dual heat exchanger has uh, two refrigerant circuits and one water circuit. One water circuit, and um, there are uh, if if both refrigerant circuits are are, are are operational, then there is no difference between a true dual and a and a, and a, a standard heat exchanger. If only one of the refrigerant circuits are operating, then it's different. So there are uh, um, they they react a little bit differently. It's not a uh, it's not a very big difference. But um, uh, if only one refrigerant circuit is operating, then you have to account for that. Um, that is as specific I can be without spending too much time of of showing. I didn't. I don't have any visualization material for that specific question okay um and then i had a couple more uh, some more positive feedback for you very informative thank you adam so you've done <laughs> a good you. job today. thank you thank, thank you for <laughs> taking care of my ego today but let's, let's well, yeah. <laughs> but any <laughs> any more questions or this is um that's that's all the questions um that's all the questions okay. we have Good, but then I uh, I uh, thank you everybody who participated and um, and uh, please reach out to to me and Summer if you have more questions and uh, and of course to your favorite SWAP contact we will be happy to help you uh, in in US Europe or Asia we are here for you. <laughs>